And he asked me uh, where I was at in James. I said, well, we're, we're in Hebrew still. <laughs> and he couldn't believe that because he's always been, uh, been way ahead of me. And now, or behind me, rather. Now he's way ahead. Uh, and I told him, I said, well, it was a few weeks ago when I was working on my lesson there at home. And I said something to Donna about it. And she said, didn't you finish Hebrew up weeks ago? And I said, no, we're still in it. And <laughs> so uh, we've only got seven more verses to go. I would like to be able to finish this up today if I can manage that. I hope, hopefully it will. We're, we're in verse 17. We had begun there uh, last week or ended there. Obey those who rule over you and be submissive. And we talked about that at length and the things that are involved in it. And so as we begin today, we're going to begin talking about why that's the case, why we need to obey and submit to them. And first of all, he says, it's because they watch out for your souls. Uh, being an elder is not an easy thing. It's, it's a tremendous responsibility that God's given to those men. Uh, and I think about when you look at the uh, qualifications given for elders in 1 Timothy chapter 3. And I, I thought about it when we talked, studied in 1 Timothy, I talked about it, that Sometimes I think the first qualification that's given for an elder is, is overlooked. Uh, because Paul says, he that desires the office of a bishop desires a good work. Uh, there has to be the desire to be an elder. And it has to be a desire not for the prestige of being in a position of an elder uh, that might come with that. But it's the desire for a good work. And among the work that elders are required to do is they are to be those responsible for watching out over the flock. Uh, and as you think about that, the, the word watch here is, is different from what I would have thought it'd be. Uh, it's not the word episcopane. Uh, you know, uh, the, the word episkopos is the word which we get uh, for the elders. They're called that in the Greek, and it's a word that means overseer. But he doesn't use that word in watching over us. It's not the work there of a technical work of an overseer, but the word that he uses there is the word that is used in exhortations in regard to the coming judgment. For example, in Mark chapter 13 in verse 33, where Jesus is speaking of the coming judgment, uh, he tells his disciples, take heed, watch, and pray, for you do not know when the time is. And that's the same word there that's, that's translated watch that's used here. And so it may be here that watching out for your souls or watching out in regard uh, to the time of judgment. And so they've got a great responsibility that God gives to them. Uh, and F.F. Bruce pointed out that in this idea of watching, it also suggests the idea of losing sleep. Uh, because the responsibility they have of watching for the souls of men there may be times where they don't get the rest that others of us do because of, of their concern for the soul of each individual uh, that, that's under their oversight, those that they're responsible for. And no reason why, because it says that they must give account in, in watching out over us. Uh, is the realization they're going to have to give an account someday to God uh, for those that are under uh, their oversight. Uh, Brother Milligan, along with several others that I was, books that I were looking to, uh, make a comparison between the responsibility given to these elders and the responsibilities that was given by God to Ezekiel in this regard. You know, God uh, had, uh, had appointed Ezekiel to be a watchman. And uh, just look at these verses. Uh, as he talks about, he says, When I say, God says, When I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life. That same wicked man shall die in his in iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. Yet, if you warn the wicked, and he does not turn from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. Again, when a righteous man turns from his righteousness and commits iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die because you did not give him warning, he shall die in his sin. And his righteousness, which he did, shall not be remembered. But his blood I will require at your hand. Nevertheless, if you warn the righteous man that the righteous should not sin, and he does not sin, he shall surely live, because he took warning. Also you will have delivered your soul. So the tremendous responsibility that, that God laid upon Ezekiel 
to warn those uh, of sin. And if they'll heed the warning, they'll save themselves, and uh, Ezekiel would have uh, delivered his own soul. But if he doesn't warn them and they're lost, then God says, I'm going to require it at your hand. And so these elders who have that responsibility that they are to watch over our souls, uh, watch because of the fact that they're going to have to give an account to God for that. And and, and then you think about that and the giving account to them. Uh, that's why he says to, to those of us under the oversight of elders to let them do so with joy and not with grief. We need to, to live our lives so that the elders can do their work with joy. Now, what can we do to cause them to be filled with joy in the work they're doing? How can we be responsible for whether or not they're going to be able to do that work with joy? I mean, if they want to do it with joy, go ahead. That's fine with me. But what am I going to do to make sure that they can do it with joy? To obey God. You know, to, to listen. You remember what he's talked about here when he says that we need to obey and submit to these leaders. Uh, if, if we're the type of person that becomes rebellious and refuses to do what God wants us to do, and, and these elders are concerned for us, and they work with us to try to, to get us uh, back in a right relationship with God and living with God the way we do, and we just continue in rebellion... That takes away all their joy uh, because they're concerned about us. But it may apply all the way, you know, and does apply all the way to the judgment. Because on the judgment day, when, when the elders give a final account to God for those over who they have uh, been responsible to oversee, and, and, and if these individuals that they oversee have lived faithfully to God, and, and so are redeemed eternally, then that makes it a joy for that elder to give an account to God. Uh, and if there have been those among us, if, if we sin and the elders come to us and work with us and we repent and make our lives right with God, then, then he can give an accounting to God with joy. But if we don't obey and we're lost, uh, the elder has delivered his own soul because he's, he's warned us and he's worked with us. But there's still a sadness that he's going to experience. Knowing that there are those under his care whom he loves who haven't lived right for God. And so because of that, they're lost. And so we have a responsibility uh, to let them do their work with joy and not with grief. And, and the reason why, as he continues on with this, he says, uh, well, there's couple of verses third john four john said i have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth now that's that's true of our physical children you know your children grow up and they move away and they're living somewhere else and you know and you continue to pray for your children always and, and it's always good to hear some report you know about your child and, and how they're living for god and, and faithfully serving god wherever they're at and, and that's a great encouragement to you. But it's also a great encouragement to elders. When they can know that those that they have oversight are living righteously for God. Uh, they hear something good about you from someone out in the community talking about you. Someone that works with you and, and what you're like on the job. And how you're living as a Christian really should. That, that gives joy to the elder. But we need to realize that this joy uh, comes only when we're serving God as we should. And listen to what Paul said to the church at Thessalonica. In 1 Thessalonians 2, 19 and 20, Paul says, For what is our hope or joy, our crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you and the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For you are our glory and joy. Uh, it's not just the elders. But men like Paul, Paul says, when Christ comes back, you, brethren, there at Thessalonica, you're going to be my joy. You're going to be the reason for my rejoicing when Christ comes back because you're living faithfully to God and serving him as you should. But it'll be the same way for the elders, uh, that they'll be filled with that joy when we, under the, their oversight, are living faithfully to God 
as we should. Uh, and, and that's important. Now, there's another passage that I meant to mention here in regard to this, and that's in Acts 20 and 28 that, that we're familiar with. This is where Paul has uh, sent for the elders of Ephesus to meet him there at Miletus. And, and they come to meet Paul there, and he gives instructions to them. And in verse 28, Paul said, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to the church over which the, over, the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to feed the church of God which he's purchased with his own blood. And so uh, elders have a responsibility in doing that. And Paul's given those elders that responsibility to oversee them. Now, it was interesting to me in, in reading what different people had to say about this passage here in Hebrews. F.F. Uh, F. Bruce, I've quoted him several times. He's a denominational preacher, but he's very, very conservative. Uh, but he belongs to a denominational group. Uh, like so many of them, they refer to their preachers as the pastor uh, and, and treat them, you know, many times like uh, those who are, who are responsible for looking, overlooking uh, the church and overseeing them and their work and serving that responsible. But, but he made some interesting comments in regard to that. He said, there will always be a tendency throughout the churches for visitors who come purveying new and esoteric doctrines to be regarded as much more attractive and interesting personalities than the rather humdrum local leaders who never taught anything new but were content with the conservative line of apostolic tradition. Nevertheless, it was those local leaders and not the purveyors of strange teachings who had a real concern for the welfare of the church and a sense of their accountability to God in that respect. I think, like I said, I think he's thinking there about, primarily about preachers. You know, you have a, a preacher come in, he's from far off, and, and he's presenting some new things you've never heard before. Uh, and people can get excited about that. And then, boy, that's so much better than what we get around here. You know, our leaders are giving us the same old thing day after day, week after week. You know, they're, they're sticking strictly with the gospel that Christ has delivered to us. And yet these new people, you know, they've got something different, new. And, and people get excited about that. But you need to realize, as Bruce said, it's those local leaders who, yes, are preaching to you that same gospel over and over and over again. But they're doing that because of the fact they have concern for your welfare and that you live for God the way you should. Uh, you know, Paul says, for me to say the same things to you, is not burdensome to me, and it's necessary for you. It's, it's for your own safety and welfare. And so these elders need to lead God's people in the way that God has given to us, uh, and it may be necessary to repeat these things over and over again. You have uh, a new generation coming along, you know, and, and those young people, and they need to be taught the same things that you've been taught. And it shouldn't be a burden to any of us to do that, realizing the importance of this. And so you, you let these elders do this. You let them teach uh, these things and guide you and you listen to them so that you're obedient and submissive to them because of the fact that it's for your welfare. It's for your benefit to do that. And not to do that, he says, would be unprofitable for you. You see, if we're not obeying and submitting to our leaders, uh, and, and we don't do what we're supposed to be doing, then what does that mean for us? Why is it unprofitable for us? You're causing the elders grief, but what's happening to you? If you're not obeying, you know, and they're trying to persuade you, but you're not listening, and you continue your, your disobedience, what's going to happen to you? You're going to be lost eternally. And so in that sense, it's not profitable for you. Now, now, just think about this. That elder is going to be able to give an account to God for you, and it's either going to be in joy or it's going to be in grief. Now, if he does it in, in joy, it's going to be joyful for you too because that means you're doing what needs to be done and you're going to be saved. But if he does it in grief, it's going to be because you haven't lived for God, so it's going to be in grief for you. And so Brother Milligan says we need to so live to make sure that in the day of accounting, 
there's going to be a mutual joy between the elders and ourselves and not a mutual grief uh, because that's certainly not going to be profitable for us. We need to be concerned about doing what God wants us to do. And so he's talked about obeying and submitting to the elders, and here's why. It's because they watch out for your souls, and they are those who must give an account and we need to be concerned so that they can give that accounting to God in joy uh, and, and not with grief, because that would be unprofitable for us. Yes, sir, Merrill. Right. 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 We talked at length about that last week about uh, uh, the submitting. It may be, you know, it's a it's a difference of opinion, uh, and maybe you think like, well, what the elders suggesting, it's okay, but you know, I have an idea it would be better than that, and I think that's what we ought to do. And so I'm not going to submit to what they've suggested. Well, that that's having a bad attitude because. You know, it's not a matter of the elders telling you to do something that's sinful. They're not doing that. If they tell you to do something sinful, you can't obey. But if it's just something that's a matter of opinion and you have a, you think your opinion is better than theirs and so you're not going to submit to them, uh, then that's not going to be pleasing to God. We have a responsibility to them and to God because God's one that's made them the overseers. And so we need to be listening. And we need to do what we can to promote the unity in the church to get things moving forward. And you can't do that when you're failing to submit uh, to what the elders want us to do, uh, especially they're talking about now in matters of opinion. So the writer is encouraging the people along this line. This is what needs to be done. And, and then in the very next verse, verse 18, he says, Pray for us, for we are confident that we have a good conscience in all things, desiring to live honorably. And so the first thing he's requesting of these, these brethren to whom he's writing out, to pray for us. Uh, the word pray there is present tense. And so the idea means you keep on praying for us. It's not he's asking that you pray for us at, the, at this time, pray for me, uh, but keep on praying for me. Uh, he desires their prayers on his part. Uh, he uses the plural here, pray for us. Uh, but most uh, commentators that I've looked at, both in and out of the church, uh, all seem are in agreement that this is a, a literary plural. Uh, it's not meant to be taken literally. Uh, he goes on and says, pray for us for we are confident. Uh, but he's talking, he immediately goes from that to the next verse. He goes to the singular. Uh, but I especially urge you uh, to do this. So it goes from the plural to the singular. I, I think that all along he's talking in the singular, but he uses the plural sometimes for emphasis, uh, that it's not just him that needs prayers, but others. And he does this several times uh, in the book here. Uh, I think I put a couple of these verses up here. Hebrews 5.11 says, Of whom we have much to say. That's when he's talking about Melchizedek. And he says, Of whom we have much. Well, is there somebody else joining him in writing this letter? Is there someone else writing along with him in this letter? Uh, probably not. That's just use of that we. And then he says, For we are confident that we have a good conscience. But he's not talking about others. He's talking about himself. That he has a good conscience in this. And I, and I think that's going to be important. Uh, and then in verse 19, he goes to the singular. You know, for I especially urge you. So, uh, as he talks about this, he, he's wanting them to pray for him, to continue praying for him. And why? Well, he says, because he has this, this good, uh, good conscience. 
Uh, for we are confident that we have a good conscience. What does that mean? Why is it that having a good conscience uh, would be a reason why he's confident? I mean, why they should pray for him. You need to pray for me because I've got a good conscience. A good conscience in what sense? Uh, he's doing everything he can to spread the gospel. He's doing everything he can to teach them and to get them doing what God wants them to do. Now, sometimes we may feel like, you know, that, that what we're being asked to do, uh, we may think, well, they don't really care about, about us. That they're asking too much. Uh, but this man has a good conscience. And his good conscience involves now in what he has done in teaching these people. Uh, he feels like, you know, listen, I've done exactly what God wanted me to do. I'm teaching you the things that God wants me to do. Now, you may not feel like that. You may feel like because now in his teaching to them, one of the things he's done has opposed Judaism. Throughout this book, he's saying to these Jews, you do not want to go back to that old way of life of serving God under the law of Moses. You need to continue where you're at serving Christ. Uh, just last week we talked about, he told them, you need to go out of the camp to Jesus, bearing his reproach. Now that you leave Judaism to serve Christ, serve God as a Christian, as a child of his. And so, because that's what he's doing, he, he's doing that because his intent is for your salvation. And so, He's conscientiously providing for you exactly what God wants him to do. And he has a good conscience about that. There's several times when Paul talks about this. Turn over, someone would, to uh, Romans chapter 9. And we want to look at verses 1 and 2. Romans chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. Okay. Paul talking about his concern that he has for the brethren there at Rome. And he goes on in the very next verse and he says, I could wish myself a curse from Christ. You know, if that were possible. If it would mean the salvation of them. But he says, my conscience bears witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart for these brethren that aren't living the way they should. Uh, and so what Paul writes to them, what he's saying to them, is not because he's angry at them and he doesn't care for them. It's the very opposite. That he conscientiously is doing exactly what he's convinced God wants him to do in teaching them uh, that, that they might be saved. And so the author here of Hebrews, I believe, is doing the same thing. That he can say, in all good conscience... The things that I'm teaching you are exactly what God wants you to be taught. And you may disagree with it. You may feel like I don't care. You may feel like that I'm opposed to you because I'm opposed to, to going back to Judaism. But my conscience is a testimony to the fact that I'm doing exactly what God wants me to do. And so that's what he's concerned about. Uh, and it's in that conscience that he says he's confident that we have a good conscience. Now... With that in mind, he goes on to say then in the next verse, but I especially urge you to do this, that I may be restored to you the sooner. He's wanting them to pray for him. He's asked for their prayers. But you see, these Jews who've become Christians and are thinking about going back to the old law, these Jews may think, why should I pray for you? You're opposed to what we're doing and what we're thinking about doing. You're opposed to the old law. So why should we pray for you? Well, because what I'm doing conscientiously is what I'm convinced that God wants me to do. And, and that's what needs to be done. And he says, I especially urge you to do this, that I may be restored to you the sooner. Some translations, I, I don't know if I put down which one that was, uh, Um, 
It's not the King. It may have been the uh, Revised Standard or the NIV, or one of those that that emphasized what it said implies they have been praying for him, but he wants them to double down on their prayers for him. Uh, why is he so concerned about their prayers for him? Because God answers prayers. And he's convinced of that. He, there's something. He wants to come and see them evidently. He says, I especially urge you to do this, that I may be restored to you the sooner. Now, some people take that being restored, meaning that possibly he was imprisoned at this time, and, and he's hoping that their prayers would allow him to be released so that he could come to them sooner. You know? Or it may be something else that's hindering. We don't really know. Uh, that, that something is hindering him, though, from coming to be with him. You know, like Paul, when he wrote to the church at Rome, Paul said that he had often desired to come to them, but he said, Satan hindered me. Uh, something had been done that kept Paul from being able to go to Rome. Well, something is keeping this brother from being able to come and see these Jewish Christians that he's writing to. And so he's asking them to pray for him that he might come the sooner. Now, Evidently, he believes, you know, sooner or later, I, I might be able to come, but I want it to be sooner. And so that's why I'm asking you to, to double down on your praying. Pray even more. I think one, kind of, one translator had all the more uh, pray for me. Now, the Apostle Paul uh, was certainly one that, that believed in, in the power of prayer, and this is really talking about the, the efficacy of prayer and how prayer does work for us. Uh, this one person said it's a, it's a beautiful commentary on the efficacy of prayer. So 1 John 5 and 14, John says, Now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Having confidence that God can and will do for us what we ask him to do. Now that's based upon if we ask in keeping with his will. Jesus had said in Matthew 7, 7, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. Uh, to have that trust that if we ask of God, he will do what we need done. Again, if we ask in keeping with his will. And so this writer believes that. And uh, the Apostle Paul certainly believed that the prayers of the saints could help deliver someone. Uh, I think about when he wrote to, uh, to Philemon. Uh, verse 22, that little one chapter book, Paul says, But meanwhile, also prepare a guest room for me, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be granted to you. Philemon is one of the uh, four letters that Paul wrote from prison. Uh, and he says so in the opening verse of that little letter. Uh, Paul, a prisoner for Jesus Christ. Uh, so he's a prisoner of Christ. He's in prison at this time. But he's confident if Philemon will pray for him, that that will result in his being granted relief so he can come and see Philemon. And the Hebrew writer is saying the same thing. I want you to pray for me. Uh, put forth a greater effort in your prayer for me that I can come to you sooner. Whatever, Whether it's prison or something else that's hindering him, it can be moved out of the way. And we need to have that same kind of confidence in prayer uh, when we talk to God. Prayer is not just something to say because they think, oh, well, this, is, this is what we ought to do. Here's somebody that's really in need. And we need to pray for that person. Uh, you need to pray with the confidence that God can and will grant what you're asking if what we're asking is in keeping with his will. And so we need to pray to God in that regard. Uh, Brother Pace suggested that his reference here to, uh, you know, his, his good conscience and all, and, and what he is asking them to do, that that in itself is a sense why they should grant prayers for him. Uh, to say, in fact, you know, I deserve your prayers because I've, I've done everything that I can to encourage and help you to do what, what God wants you to do. Yes, Billy? Yeah, that needs to be a continual part of our life. 
And, and this brother understands he needs the prayers of those to whom he's writing. And uh, ought to request those things. I think sometimes we, in our lives, we feel a little bit reluctant about asking other people to pray for us. Uh, I don't know why that's the case, but uh, it, it, it happens a lot of times. But I think we should learn from this. You know, he's the, there's the power to be found in prayer. And we need to have confidence in God that he'll grant those things we need, like I said, when we're asking in keeping with his will. And so he's asking them to pray for him. Uh, and then in the next verse, verse 20, he says, Now may the God of peace, who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And so it, it, begins, it begins with that expression. He says, Now may the God of peace... That expression, God of peace, is found six other times in the New Testament. And every time it's found in the writings of Paul. I wish I had kept track of these as, as I've gone through the book of Hebrews. I'm going to have to go back through my notes now and mark all these things. Because over and over and over again, there are things that he is doing, things that he is saying, that is so much like what Paul did. If this is not Paul writing this letter, this is the only other person besides Paul who's ever referred to God as a God of peace. Uh, and I think that's all these things put together would be a reason for, for believing that Paul is the author of this book. But anyhow, God is the God of peace. Uh, Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6 describes the Messiah as being the Prince of Peace. And the God of peace through the Prince of Peace... Uh, is the one uh, to bring all of these blessings to them. Uh, it was by means of the death of Jesus that God was able to make peace between himself and mankind. And it was through Christ's death on the cross that he was able to make peace between the Jew and the Gentile. And, and there's so many passages on that. I'll go through these quickly because we're running out of time. Uh, Paul says... Uh, for he himself is our peace, who has made both one, and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to those who were far off, that's the Gentiles, and to those who were near, that's the Jews. And so these two, he's made one new man, Jew and Gentile, and they have peace with one another. And they also have peace with God because we've been reconciled to God. Both Jew and Gentile are reconciled to God through Christ and through his death there on the cross. And so it's by means of Christ's death that this has been made possible. That the God of peace has made peace with those of us who are Christians. And uh, those who become Christians are made at peace with one another. And so that's important for them uh, in that regard. Now, verse 20. Who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead. This is the means by which he made peace. Now, interesting. This is the only reference that the author makes to the resurrection of Christ in this book. Now, there are other passages where he uh, implies the resurrection of Christ. Uh, a couple of these very quickly. Hebrews 7, 25. Therefore he, that's Christ, is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he, Christ, always lives to make intercession for them. And so the fact that Christ always lives implies he's been made alive again. He was dead. He was buried but now he's alive to make intercession for us always. So he's been resurrected. Hebrews 8, 1. Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. And so Christ, and that again implies he's been resurrected. That's why he's now seated at God's right hand in, in heaven. Uh, those two passages. Then Hebrews 13 and 20. That great shepherd of the sheep. 
as he continues this, talking about Christ, here he describes Christ as the great shepherd. And again, this is the only time in the book that refers to Jesus in that way. Now, he's talked about the under-shepherds in verse 7 and 17 uh, already. The under-shepherds being those who are shepherds of the church, the elders. Uh, They're shepherds in the sense that they're responsible for feeding the church. And that's the the word shepherd there, poimain. That's what it means uh, in that regard. But now we're talking about that great shepherd, the one that's over them. And that great shepherd is Christ. He's the great shepherd of the, sh- of the sheep. When, when Jesus talked about this in, in John chapter 10 and verse 11, I don't know if I put that up here or not. No, I did not. John chapter 10 and verse 11, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He's the great shepherd. He's the one who's died to make it possible for each and every one of us uh, to live. And so Christ, that great shepherd, uh, that rules over us, and all of the shepherds of God's church here uh, are under that great shepherd also. Then next he mentions the blood of the everlasting covenant. Christ in dying for us on the cross, his resurrection not only proved that his sacrifice has been acceptable to God, but it's also proved that that covenant that he has brought has been acceptable by God. Uh, That covenant is through the blood of Christ. Now, if you think about that, that kind of hints back to what he had said earlier about the the covenant that God had made with the Israel at at the time of Moses. Uh, And at that time, that covenant was made. It was made with the covenant by the blood of animals that was sprinkled on the covenant itself and sprinkled upon the people. Uh, And so that covenant was ratified by the blood of, of animals. But now... A greater sacrifice has been made. The blood of Christ has been shed on the cross. uh, And that ratifies a greater covenant. That new covenant that we have from God that we live under in service to God today. And so we have that greater covenant uh, that God has made for us. Now, through the blood of that everlasting covenant, his prayer for them is, and this is the number one thing about his prayer is, That God would make you complete in every good work. How's God going to make us complete unto every good work? And immediately, when I read this passage, my thoughts went back. I'll put it up here. Go back to to Paul's words to Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. Now that's his prayer here for these brethren that he's writing to, that God would make them complete in every good work. And God's going to do that through his word that he's given. Paul says that word uh, makes us complete to every good work. It's sufficient. It's all we need. And so he's praying for that for the people. And that they will allow that word to guide them in their lives. Uh, It would equip them to every good work. Then in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 13, Paul says, For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. And that's something else that he's concerned about that he prays about. And again, that comes about God does that. He works in us. But he works in us through his word that he has given. And then very quickly, as we end it, uh, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Probably here, it's not to Jesus Christ that be the glory and glory forever and ever, but to God. If you have an American Standard translation and you look at the way it's punctuated, it makes it clear that this is referring to God. Uh, Brother Milligan says, if you look at simply uh, from the teaching of the Bible, it could be the one. There are passages that teach that God is the one to receive glory and honor from us, Romans 16, 27. But there are also passages, as what Peter wrote in 2 Peter 3, 18, that glory and honor is to Christ for what he's done. So it could be the one in that respect. But grammatically, here it seems to indicate that it's talking about 
uh, God to receive that glory and honor. Uh, those are the two passages. Uh, I'm doing this because our time's gone here. Hebrews 13, 22, I appeal to you, brethren, uh, bear with the word of exhortation, for I have written to you in few words. Uh, and we're just not going to have time to get through this. There were a couple of things I want to say about this. Next week, though, we will end these two verses here in Hebrews 13. And then we'll begin immediately with James. We're going through the, the Bible in the, in the order we think which these books were written. And it just so happened that these two books that are one after the other in our Bible uh, were also written uh, one after the other. So, James, next week. Thank you very much.